Hi guys, um, welcome back. We're ready to move on to cover the content in chapter eight, and this is about soil colloids, um, which is essentially kind of soil chemistry. Um, and this chapter is a little bit more scientifically and certainly on a chemistry um, scope more in depth than some of the other content that we've gone over. And I know that not everyone has taken um, necessarily a college level chemistry class. Um, so I'm going to try to go through and pick out the things that I think are most relevant and important to us. But as a result, we're going to kind of pick and choose and skip around the chapter a little bit more than we have done with some other chapters. So this first section, I'm really just going to focus on kind of figuring out what a colloid is. Um, and that's kind of the content that's discussed in the first section. Um, section 8.1, at least in the fourth edition. Um, and then I'm going to have another um, short video where I talk about the kind of content between um, sections 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, and 8.9, um, which kind of talk a little bit about exchange of um, cations and colloids and um, sources of charges in the soil and whatnot. Um, but we're going to definitely take out a chunk of the middle of the chapter, like 8.2 through 8.5, and then some of the last sections of the chapter we're not really going to go over. So um let me share my screen with you so we can get started okay so what is a col colloid well a colloid is the term that we use to describe basically these really small particles that are in the soil so when we've talked about texture of the soil before we've kind of said that the texture is dependent on how much sand silt and clay there is and then remember clay is defined as kind of the smallest particle of mineral material that's in the soil so when we have soil that has a lot of clay or we have soil that has a lot of humus which is basically a word for small broken down pieces of organic matter then the soil has a large colloidal fraction. And in particular, we can actually measure this to see um, that these would be pieces that are less than two microns or one millionth or two millionths of a meter. And here's a little picture for scale in the soil of what this kind of thing would look like. And this is where a lot of the chemical and biological reactions are really happening in the soil. So this is called the kind of reactive um, seed of the soil, the chemically hot seed of the soil, or reactive fraction of the soil. So um, the small particulates in the soil, these colloids, have an enormous surface area. And the more surface area they have, the more area there is uh, along which different kinds of chemical and biological reactions can happen. So basically the reason that this is such the uh, an important reactive component of the soil is just because there's so much more space on which these different reactions can take place. So here's a picture of clay again, and hopefully we remember that clay is made up of these really flat sheets. So the kind of exterior clumps of clay themselves are quite small compared to sand and even silt. But then within those little clumps, they're broken down into these little sheets. And so they have all the surface area on the outside of the clumps because there's so many tiny little clumps, but then they have all this extra surface area on all the interior little pages like pages in a notebook and all this is area on which um, chemical and biological reactions occur so these are not numbers you need to um, memorize in any way but um, just interesting for me to think about um, the external surface area of colloids is really high um, so if we have one gram of soil which would be about like one sugar cube size of soil um, it would be we would be able to spread out these little clumps um, so much so that they would take up 10 square meters of area. So if you imagine taking a sugar cube and trying to spread it out to cover 10 square meters, that in and of itself is impressive. And that's about a thousand times more surface area than we would get from a sand. But then if we were going to kind of dismantle the pieces into all their internal sheets and then try to spread them out, they would cover more like 800 square meters, which is a lot more area. And then another fun fact I like about soil that it shares in the textbook is that one hectare of soil, which is about two acres, that's kind of like the metric version of the um, acre, 
with about 25% clay content, you could take that surface layer of soil, the top meter of soil, and you could spread it out to cover the entire United States, which is really very impressive. Okay, so um, one of the reasons that the, the surface area is so reactive is because there's charges on the surface, these electrostatic charges, and they can bond on to other kinds of ions, um, and other compounds in the soil. So um, we'll kind of think through how this works a little bit later, but mostly um, the clays in the soil have a negative electrostatic charge. Um, and some exceptions to that would be when we have very super acidic soil, um, that in that case, sometimes positive charges dominate or some volcanic soils. We'll talk through some of those exceptions later. Um, but these then negative charges are, of course, good at holding on to positively charged things. And these are called cations in the soil. So also, um, water um, is something that can bond onto these charges as well. Um, you might remember that we said water is a polar molecule. Um, and polar molecules have both a positive and negative charge. So water can bond onto both positive and negatively charged things. Um, so water can bond onto things as well. And hopefully um, we want soil that can hold water and other um, cations and other nutrients tightly enough that they don't get flushed out every time it rains and water infiltrates down into the soil. But then we don't want them to be held so tightly that they're not available for plant uptake or by use by other organisms in the soil. Okay, so when we think about um, what this looks like, um, remember we have kind of the external pieces of clay and then the internal sheets within the clay. So we have a picture on the left and then a diagram on the right from your textbook. So you can see um, basically all the little like pieces of paper on the right are these surface areas and then they're surrounded by all these different kinds of ions um, that are bonding both to the outside, the external surface, but then also to all these internal surfaces. And so these are things like calcium, aluminum, potassium, um, that are potentially nutrients um, for plants and organisms in the soil. And this process is called adsorption. Um, adsorption is kind of the bonding of these materials onto the soil surface. Um, and then again, just want to say that um, water, of course, is another thing that bonds onto the soil as well. We mentioned that, again, water is polar, so it has the positive side where the hydrogens are kind of located, and then the negative side, kind of the butt of the water molecule that doesn't have these hydrogen ions. That's where the electrons are concentrated, and that gives it a slight negative charge. And so these water molecules can get in and bond onto negatively charged surfaces or positively charged surfaces. And as they do that, they can get in between these internal surfaces and cause swelling. So earlier in the semester, we learned about vertisols, these clay soils that swell up when water is available and then shrink down and crack apart when the water is uptake by plants or other organisms or evaporated um, throughout the year. And sometimes, even if the water isn't available to plants um, and it's tightly, tightly bonded on these internal surfaces and may be able to be accessible by other kinds of soil um, organisms like different kinds of soil microbes. Okay, so there's a couple different kinds of things that might be um, different soil colloids and we're going to go through kind of four different categories of things that are um, soil microbes. Um, so the first things are called non-crystalline silicate clays. So crystalline refers to um, a compound that has this kind of very precise structure. So if you think of like a crystal, uh, like quartz crystal, it has this like very precise internal structure that gives it this very kind of clean and perfect form. So these are kind of non-crystalline silicate clay. So they're going to have like a little bit more of um, a less precise structure. And they are mostly made up of things like silicon, oxygen, and aluminum. And they're, again, don't have patterns that are quite as perfect or crystalline. And we might find these in things like volcanic ash. So do you remember which is the soil order that has a lot of volcanic ash? Maybe you remember andosols is that order. And um, these particular kinds of compounds may, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, have positive as well as negative charges. 
charges. And positive charges are good because they can help bond to certain kinds of um, nutrients in the soil that have negative charges. So, so far I mentioned cations, things that have positive charges like calcium, um, potassium that might be able to be bonded onto soil colloids. But in some cases we might have um, things like phosphates, nitrates, or sulfates that um, have important soil nutrients and they can be bonded on to these um, volcanic ash. And so that's one of the reasons that volcanic ash can provide good quality um, nutritious soil for different kinds of plants. Um, okay, the second one I want to mention is a group of iron and aluminum oxides. So we've mentioned um, these when we talked about things like oxisols, these very weathered soils that might appear red because aluminum oxide, or sorry, iron oxide has a reddish color. Um, these may or may not be crystalline. Here's a picture of one. And these particular things do not hold nutrients very well. So when we mentioned like wet, very weathered or oxidized or old soils are usually not very nutritious in and of themselves. And we mentioned this is the case with tropical soils. Um, then humus, right? Humus is this very small fragment of organic matter. And like a lot of other organic matter, a lot of organic matter has these kind of um, hexagonal um, kind of round shapes. So it almost kind of looks like a sponge. Um, if you will. And these are not mineral, so they're not crystalline. They don't have this super precise inorganic crystal structure, but they do have these often, like I said, hexagonal chains or rings um, that are kind of classic organic um, compound structures. Um, they'll be made up of oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, and they have really good water holding capacity. Just like a sponge has a really good water holding capacity, water can get in all in the inside to these chains and rings and be um, well stored in the soil that contains a lot of humus. Um, okay, that's uh, where we're gonna stop and then we'll record a second video about more details next.